it's our community and I'm Mary Davidson and I am so pleased that you've come back to visit with us as we talk to all of our wonderful neighbors that live so very close that we may or may not know. Our guest this morning, I must tell you that I have known for a very long time. So as I told John Tibbetts, I know lots about him and we're going to discuss a very interesting man who has led a most interesting life. John Tibbetts is an artist. He's a piano player, right. he's a film historian, mm -hmm. and he's a film critic. Don't forget and Man About Town, a man about town. Bon Vivant. There you go. Yes, and an author, and he's on the faculty at the University of Kansas. I think maybe a Renaissance man, John. See modestly how, how modestly he accepts that? Well, I get out my telescope like Galileo and check out the heavens so I can <laughs> qualify in that direction as well. <laughs> Well, you know, when I first met John, he was, I think you were teaching at, at the college, weren't you? I did. Yeah. Under Doreen Morundi's tutelage at the Humanities Department, I taught a course one night a week. But so I think one of, years. one of the most interesting things, you used to publish a magazine. Right. What did you, I forgot what you called it. It was called American Classic Screen. That's right. And it was the publication of the National Film Society, which the magazine and it lasted about eight years. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we were way ahead of Turner Classic Movies because they do all of these conventions of uh, movie stars where you meet and greet and show films. We were doing that in the late 70s into the late 80s for years. So we were ahead of the game. Well, and I, as I recall, um, the covers of each of those right. magazines had a portrait that you yeah. had drawn. One of them is here. One of them is here. Oh, did, was this the cover? That one was of on those? one of the covers. Was it yeah. really? Mm -hmm. oh, the Wizard of... O Z. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and but I did tell John. I think I thought I think you've really gotten better every year. Mm -hmm. You've gotten better oh. as the years have gone on, John. Well, thank I really you very believe much. that. You met a lot of stars in those in the seventies. Yeah, and then of course in the eighties into the nineties, I was at KCTV five, where I had a lot more, and Channel forty one for a few years, where mm -hmm. I had a program called AM Live in yeah. the mornings. And in both of those television stations, I also had many opportunities to uh, meet, greet, and interview movie stars, directors, and also on my work at KXTR Radio, remember KXTR? I do, I do. In the music field. That I had went bye-bye. Yeah, too bad. I met and interviewed many pianists and composers and well, people who would come to town, you know. I'm always fascinated by people that are uh, in some many ways above my pay grade. <laughs> so I, I, let's talk about some of those people. In the 70s, who, pick out a, a really interesting person or persons. Well, for the National Film Society event in Los Angeles, I remember one year I met Betty Davis, Elizabeth Taylor, and Jane Fonda, you were all kinda, under one roof. That was on overload there. Trying to, uh, get rid of a stammer and think of something to say. I was pretty starstruck in those days. Tell me about Betty, uh, Betty Davis. Well, twice I met her over uh -huh. a span of several years in the 70s. Uh -huh. And the first time she had not yet had the stroke that paralyzed oh, yeah. part of her but face. She was getting old by that time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, but always rather imperious. Oh, absolutely. Always very aware of her station in the scheme of things. Queenly, might we say? Uh, well, I like the word imperious As because imperious. <laughs> it, it connotes a little bit more of, I'm in control of I this, think. John. <laughs> and so as long as you were aware of that and didn't try and wrest control from her, I mean, who would try? Who would try? Uh, right. She was fine. Now, Jane Fonda, on the other hand, was still young in the game and very much an up-and-comer. Had she done, finished, just finished Barbarella at that time? Let's see, I think Barbarella was still around that time, uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. And uh, very conscious of where is the makeup mirror. Very conscious of the makeup. Really? Yeah, in fact, I met was her Was she again. not so nice looking? <laughs> I mean, why would she? I never saw anything to complain oh, I of. Gonna, <laughs> I was going to say, tell me exactly what the problem is. She and Joan Collins are the two ladies that I've interviewed that were most conscious of always having uh, hairspray available, somebody just off camera with a can. Really? Always having a mirror to check uh, makeup and stuff like that. Um, in fact, I remember going down a corridor to meet uh, Joan Collins. I was behind her. She walked down. And there was a woman with a spray can 
in between us spraying her oh, as know. she walked down the corridor. Can you imagine being no. surrounded no. by an entourage like that? No, uh, no, I can't. I also can't imagine being so obsessed with your appearance. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to me, there's so many more important things in life. And I realize that their appearance mm -hmm. Uh, depended on their success sure. to, in great that measure. Is, that is their career. Yeah, and but you know, I gotta say, John, um, I'm here to I am here to tell you that everybody gets old, <laughs> and so and so you can't always. The jig is up, huh? The jig is up. Yeah, that's right. Too and, bad. You know, you have to have something else besides a beautiful face and a nice figure. Well, I've often you. wondered what it would be like for somebody whose career rested on their face and form and youth in general. I met Mary Pickford once briefly uh -huh. at her home in what then was called Pick Fair, oh, yeah. where she lived with Buddy Rogers from Olathe, uh -huh. whom she had married after she divorced Douglas Fairbanks. Well, I was visiting Buddy around 1977 in Los Angeles, went out to Pick Fair, mm -hmm. spoke with him, and he said, would you like to meet Mary? Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, she's already a legend. You didn't totally, have to think about it. <laughs> totally away from the public <laughs> yeah, view. Yeah. And so there at the end of the corridor was her room. I stood in the threshold. Buddy introduced me, and I still have this image in my head of a, like a flower that had been pressed into a, an album. Was she frail at that she time? She was frail. Now, she was older than he Oh, was. yes. yes oh, yes. Quite a bit. Uh -huh. um, I won't say how old. Thank you. Yeah. But sitting, resting against, uh, she was in bed clothes, sitting, resting against the back of the bed, very composed, very frail voice. I didn't advance any further in, didn't shake her hand or anything like that. But it's at a moment like that when you think this is a woman that goes back to 1909 yeah. making movies. Yeah. Similarly, Lillian Gish I met and interviewed at the same, who had the same kind of pedigree and lineage. Now Lillian Gish went into her elderly years just fine, just a boat with all the sails going. Uh -huh. But Mary retired from public eye, and so you kind of wonder what was it like maybe for her to look at her old films, to see I think, that image? You know what I think, John? I think it's kind of like these politicians that don't want to give up their political seat even though it's time and they mm -hmm. know it's time because the power and the recognition and the public adulation that goes with all of these um, jobs, if you want to call them mm -hmm. that, is really, it's uh, addictive. But Many cross a line and then just retire utterly from public view because there's just, you can't play the game. Well, do you think anymore. it's because they don't want people to see well, them? Of course not. Yeah. No. And I think that kind of makes sense. They would love for them to be remembered as they were. That's both a trap that they fall into, and yet that's their passport to a living celebrity. Yeah. Ironically. But you know, it's interesting because the people that you're mentioning are mostly women. And these women were smart. They were Betty Davis, uh, Mary Pickford. Mm. They were good business women. Oh. Even Jane Fonda. I mean, they they could have run a company, which indeed they did. The company was them. Well, by 1917, she was the richest woman in the world, yeah. and one of her producers said that she had a cash register brain. That's how astute she was as a businessman. Yeah. Now, before taxes, can you figure? $10,000 a week guaranteed, plus a, per a high percentage of the gross of all your pictures. And you're turning out maybe eight pictures a year at that point. You do the computation. Yeah. yeah. And she had no children, did she? No. Yeah. And there are some uh, rumors about that sort of thing, which I won't go into. Uh -huh. But uh, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., she sort of officially adopted. Mm -hmm. um, after she was married to Buddy. Mm -hmm. And Fairbanks Jr., whom I've met many times, was always very kind and very gallant towards Mary. Uh, now he was her stepson. Stepson, yeah. right. Fairbanks had been married before, oh, mm -hmm. and he came from that marriage. Mm -hmm. So th they were royalty in Hollywood. They I were. mean, if you want to talk about the glory days of old Hollywood, you can begin and end right there at well, You know, every once in a while, I'll see in the paper where so and so has bought a home that belonged to one of the mm -hmm. members of the yeah. glorious uh, group that, that, <coughs> were, uh, that were Hollywood. Well, Pickfair was, I think, really yeah. the first of the really Class A Hollywood homes in Beverly Hills, and everybody followed suit.
Were any of these women that we're talking about kind, nice people? Oh, absolutely. Um, as long as you respected Betty Davis's station in life, fine. In fact, one of the nicest I've ever met was Meryl Streep, and you don't oh, get any bigger is. than that. I bet she is nice. The thing I think what impressed me most about Meryl Streep was that she listened to your questions, mm -hmm. and then she considered them. She thought, and then she would speak, and you never had the sense that you were getting a jukebox answer, you know, where you press the button and out comes uh -huh. a prepackaged response. Yeah. Funny, fourth, com uh, fourth uh, right, and uh, now she is progressing into older age very gracefully, oh, and, and with her film roles and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I can't. The only one, <laughs> the only people, if I were gossiping. Oh, I love that. That were Go. probably problematic were more the daughters of the movie queens. Raquel really? Welch's daughter, for example, uh, was a real pill. Really? And the people that are just on the way up, and especially maybe if they come from a well-known family where they feel like they have to prove themselves. And that's, that's that a can little be tough. tough. That's a little tough. How <laughs> about Elizabeth Taylor? We missed her. Um, didn't actually interview her. I was with her for an awards presentation. Uh -huh. Could not have been nicer. Hair was black still at that point. Well, <laughs> listen, I mean, John, that's not that, that's probably the least of the problems yeah. there. <laughs> could could not have been nicer. I think the if you're looking though for an encounter I had that was very peculiar was uh -huh. with Rita Hayworth. Oh, really? Now we she in, was an interesting. She well, had a. Yeah, interesting. we were in Washington D.C. and we had given her an award from the National Film Society uh -huh. for lifetime uh -huh. achievement. Uh we had noticed already that she seemed kind of absent in her responses, distracted, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a bit slow of speech. Well, she had Alzheimer's. She speech. was already in the beginning yeah. stages of Alzheimer's, which had not yet really been either diagnosed or announced publicly. Mm. And I remember vividly being on the platform presenting her this plaque, yeah. and she picked it up and held it upside down during oh. the entire presentation in a rather breathless series of short responses and you knew right away that something was definitely that wrong. something was definite yeah. well um, she started out as a flamenco dancer I believe well she was a great dancer uh -huh. and uh, Cancino was her name at that point and she had to have surgery you know on her hairline to do what the hairline was was far enough down on the forehead that <laughs> for some reason Hollywood objected to that they thought she was too close to her and, eyebrows and her skin was lightened <laughs> up really oh she w underwent a wholesale makeup job. Now, <laughs> while I'm at it, how about somebody who was definitely on the neurotic side? Yes. That was Ida Lupino. Really? Um, great respected lady in the business. Yes, she was. A pioneering uh, woman director in the 40s into the 50s. Yes, she was. Uh, it was exciting to meet her, but we couldn't get her off the stage. Instead, she produced a picture of Howard Duff, her late husband, husband and proceeded yeah. to badmouth him in front of thousands in the audience. <laughs> We're sitting there wondering, how do we get her off stage? Finally, we gave a cue to the orchestra. And, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, go out on the stage like this. But it was actually quite stressful because well, where sure. is she going with this? Well, you never know. And none of it really made a whole lot of sense. Maybe it, she was not... Oh, well, I... I don't know. I'm not going to speculate, but uh, there are moments like that, too, that make you realize that you're dealing with kinds of individuals who, I won't say neurotic, but they've spent their entire lifetime in different roles. Well, they have, and they... Maybe aren't quite sure who they are. Who they are in their own skin, mm -hmm. and I think... Um, they say about comedians that they are as neurotic as you get because when they're on stage, uh, they're funny, uh, but when they're off stage, they're depressed. And I think uh, the portrait that you've done of yeah. Robin Williams is a um, sort of epitomizes the, the problems that comedians. Did you yeah. ever meet him? Oh, several times. In what fact, kind let's, of a person was let's he? Let's see if we can name the characters here. Well, that's Popeye. There's Popeye, and on the other side, uh, Mrs. Is, Doubtfire. Mrs. Doubtfire. And then Robin, of course. Now, the character a lot of people forget. I, I can't He played you. a little boy named Jack. In, in what the movie? The movie was called Jack. Jack. I don't mm -hmm. remember that at all. I found him to be a person of extremes. Mm -hmm. When he was serious, reflective, thoughtful, soft-spoken, mm -hmm. wow, 
We're talking major focus, very impressive. And very bright. Oh, quick. Mm -hmm. But when he would slip in and out of characters, as he often would do, uh, he loved slipping into the character of a phony evangelist, for example. <laughs> you know, put yeah. your hand on the television. <laughs> um, then he was somebody else, not even in the same room with you. And it's like, mm -hmm. can we rein him in? Or indeed, do we want to? Yeah, do you want Just to? Just let him go. Well, he and Jonathan Winters were... Um, birds of a feather. Birds of a feather, yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I do think um, it, it's kind of uh, difficult to be schizophrenic as, a, as characters go because who really are you? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're only comfortable in someone <coughs> else's skin. Yeah. that someone else has written. Which is to our benefit. Absolutely, but, but not necessarily to theirs. We certainly know, as if we didn't already imply or infer, that he was a very troubled, very troubled. person. Yeah. But I like the fact that when I met these people, I could bring something like that into the interview, and hopefully it would convey to them that I cared, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it meant something to me to prepare, and then he would sign it. And many times they would ask for copies. Mm -hmm. And I found, <laughs> I found it was quite convenient to say, well, I'd be happy to send you one, but not to your agent. I'd want to make sure it came to your home. So you had all the addresses. Great way to get private mailing addresses. So one, one would be uh, very uh, interested in your little black book. Oh, well, unfortunately, very dated at this point, dated I suppose. You'll point. note that goes back to 97. Yeah. I think my first autographs, actually the first portrait I ever did that was autographed by a celebrity was of Ray Bradbury, I the, the writer, the fantasy oh, writer. Oh, the Fahrenheit fantasy writer, that's right, yeah, yeah. And that was in 1966. I was an did art student. Did he come to KU? Team. No, no, I was an art student at KU and simply set off a drawing of him out of respect oh, for his work. I was a big fan already as a sophomore at KU. It, it came back to me in the mail with this lovely inscription on it and it inaugurated a correspondence and friendship I had with him for what, more than 40 years. I think that's wonderful. I really miss him. You know, talking about your art, you said that it was so difficult to draw Judy Garland's oh face. Oh my gosh. Why? Is there some way Why? we could get in tight? On her face? Am I in the way? Can we get no, in tight no, we on can, her face? No, no, we can go in on her face. Why, why do you think that was so? I spent more time. On her face? I don't know. For one thing, you don't have a lot to work with. It's very simple features. Mm -hmm. Very basic, very regular. She doesn't have a big nose or buck teeth. No, or, and yeah. she doesn't have a lot of fur and whiskers. That's right, that's right. <laughs> like the cowardly <laughs> that's right, lion. That's right. <laughs> or, or there's no metal on her head. Did like you ever the, meet her? Uh, no, I never no, met no her. Matter. No, she passed on before. I had a chance. If you so I just, I sweat bullets, and I think I finally got her. Well, you did. But uh, she is by far the toughest likeness I've ever tried to get of a movie. Well, person. maybe th maybe that is true because she doesn't really have an outstanding. Her voice is outstanding, <laughs> but that's difficult. To draw. She and Humphrey Bogart. I, I'm going to challenge you on this. Okay. Find a photograph or a still of either one of them that you could say, "Yeah, that looks like her or him." You're yeah. going to find that what we have in our mind's eye is a composite of her moving image. Uh -huh. But when you would stop her in her tracks with a still photograph or uh -huh. bogey, uh -huh. somehow, as I found whenever I would look for photographs of them, they never were quite, that's not quite the bogey uh -huh. I think of or the garland that it's I think of. It's interesting. Yeah, that I, drives you crazy if you're doing portraits. Well, that's right. <laughs> Who would you have to pick as the most interesting celebrity that you've ever met? Oh, Steven Spielberg. Tell me why. Oh my gosh. Why? I was totally unprepared, and I'm going to sound like an unabashed film geek here. <laughs> I won't tell, Joe. <laughs> I, was, I was totally unprepared for a kind of charisma about the guy you can cut with a knife. On really? television and film, you see him many times. Uh -huh. But he comes into a room, and he fills that room with authority. He's on top of his skates. He knows what he's doing. His speech is quick and sharp, and he uses gestures in a very interesting way as well. Here I'm going, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I was mesmerized by this guy. I can readily see how people like him, and I'm gonna rope Walt Disney into this, mm -hmm. had a natural charisma, a follow me boys yeah. sort of quality. And I felt it too, it's like, can I follow you out of here? I'll empty your waste baskets, uh, you know, 
anything to work with you. I could see how people but could John, feel that kind I of loyalty. But John, I just saw a special on Ed Koch just recently. Yeah. And he said, in the, I mean, no matter what you think of him, he propelled himself into the public spotlight mm -hmm. and made himself, as he said, you have to be larger than life and you have to have about you some sort of aura that people will follow. And I think that's true. Yeah, All except, of the, except I would never say Spielberg was larger than life. That was his quality, it is his quality. There's an unassuming, modest, yet I am in control of my life quality that uh, comes at you in a different way than impressing you. But they're all smart, John. Oh, oh. They're all of these people are smart that we're talking about. Yeah. They may be depressed. They may be neurotic. They may have a, um, a, a, a complex of being grandiose, but they're all smart. They have, all of them have that in common. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to interview some very, very fine directors and producers. Jim Henson Oh, the Muppets. Is another one. And this was a few years before he died when uh -huh. his film Labyrinth came out. Uh -huh. And I'm fond of telling people this story that as we spoke to each other, mm -hmm. he was always gesturing with his hand. Working the puppets. And I said, <laughs> it's like Kermit is with us. Uh -huh. And immediately his hand snapped into position and he spoke in Kermit's voice. Well, I mean to say Kermit was yeah, with yeah, us. Yeah, Kermit was there. For a few minutes. And then finally Kermit said, well, I have to go now. I'm not wearing any clothes, you know. <laughs> now, for Henson to do stuff like that, just off the cuff, to go along with you as an interviewer mm -hmm. was great fun. And I, I tell you, his untimely death, what a shock. It was very sudden. Wasn't what a it? loss, yeah. because everything about that man that came across, at least in my exposure to him, was just 100% honest. And now his children seem heart. to have carried on some. Yeah, somehow. yeah, and they are indeed. Well, wouldn't you? I mean, this is a franchise oh, oh, that well, you yes, can't of course I that would. you can't let go. You know, you brought up a subject a little earlier that I want to tease out a little bit, and that is the children of these people. Mm -hmm. Often they're troubled. Often they are not successful. Often they, well, most often they are definitely not of the same cloth as their parents. What happened? Well, I'm going to come back to Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who grows up the son of the biggest name in the world in terms of male movie stars, mm -hmm. and yet somehow survived. He always said, I am my own man, but I will never disown the Fairbanks name. Mm -hmm. Now, he was very intelligent, and I think part of that came from the fact that he did not live with his dad for a long time, but with his mother. mother. Uh -huh. Maybe there's a secret there that when the child of a celebrity has a chance maybe to grow up at some distance from that spotlight, uh, perhaps there's a, a better than even chance for some kind of normalcy in their life. Well, that but now, parent... But look at the Michael Douglases. Yeah. They but, grow but up in that spot, the yes, Jeff Bridges. But the brother of Michael Douglas didn't do so well. Yeah. See, they're not all... Well, you're, you're right. You know. But maybe that's in every family. Well, I think it is, but I also think it's very hard to come into one's mm -hmm. own as the child of a, a, a larger-than-life mm -hmm. person. I mean, that those are big shoes and a long shadow, and it's 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 difficult not to want to reach um, the success that a parent yeah. has had because it makes the child feel a little lesser. I think. Now, another very well-adjusted lady was Margaret O'Brien. Now, let me remind everybody, Margaret O'Brien was in uh, Meet Me in St. Louis. Yes. And she was the little girl. And she was in many, many films, early films, and just one of the great charmers of all time and a wonderful little actress. Did you meet her? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I fell in love with Margaret oh. O'Brien. <laughs> because as a woman in her middle years, she still was just a magnificent person, had been through it all, and had adjusted and was quite willing to talk about it. And she was a person who, because she had been thrown on her own so often in that business, she had to cope. And she was the first to admit that not everybody could. Everybody needs that parent all the time yeah. or needs a normal parent away from the spotlight yes, all the time. Yes. Um, but she's one of the great success stories. And another one was Diana Sarah Carey, who was a lady named Baby Peggy in the silent movies. 
she survived mm -hmm. and she has written books about the child stars and she worked a lot with uh, Jackie Coogan, you know, who was the kid in the Chaplin film. But Jackie mm -hmm. Coogan ends up as Uncle Fester. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and he had a very, very tough time. Yes, I think but he did. But he, he wrote a book about it, too. So you kind of feel sorry for the fact that they're in the spotlight all the time, and then what happens when they get older? Um, I'm really crazy about Emma Watson. Who she sounds very well. Oh, she's wonderful. She does work for the United Nations yes. now. And in the paper, I read a little article about her. What a lovely talk or speech she gave. Oh, I know. About, uh, and see, I, but I think um, it's a wonderful thing to see a, a child star that can evolve into a, yeah. a giving and uh, productive adult. Now, Shirley Temple managed to maintain an adolescent popularity in movies up until the late 40s. I think mm -hmm. she did uh, Fort Apache with John yeah, Ford. Yeah, she did, but that wasn't the greatest. But, but yeah. you know, she had the good grace to pretty much retire. She, she got did. into diplomacy. She did. Um, a wonderful statesman. The ability to uh, move with the times, yeah. I think, is something, th and again, it's the same thing. And it's to hard. survive adolescence, because adolescence right. is the great okay. enemy of the for camera. Everyone. For well, everyone. Well, that's right, but for everyone. Out, Pimples are not In and good. out of the camera, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. John, I, uh, what fun. I, where are you, what are you doing now? Are you still writing? And uh, do you well, still play I, the piano? I still play piano for silent films whenever nobody else can be found. Uh-huh. Uh, um, I had two books out in recent months. One is on the Australian filmmaker Peter Weir, uh -huh. who did The Truman Show, uh -huh. Dead Poets Society. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I went to Australia on a sabbatical uh -huh. and met him, and it was one of the great experiences of my life because I'm like this with Peter Weir. Yeah. And uh, another book is on, guess who, Douglas Fairbanks. I figured he was one of your favorite people. He was my first book in 77, and I did a greatly expanded update recently. In fact, I just got back from Hollywood where I presented, launched the book at the old Egyptian theater, oh my downtown goodness. Hollywood. And we had, of all people, the widow of Gene Kelly oh my goodness. with me, who talked about the acrobatic stunt work of Kelly, how it had been influenced by Fairbanks. And we showed and he clips. Was. He was a swashbuckler. Oh, yeah. He most assuredly was. Uh, yeah. I, you know. Give me a cape and sword, and I'm happy. Are you happy? Well, if you could play a little piano in the middle, that'd be good. Well, that'd be tough to do all three at the same time. <laughs> Swashbuckle well, and play piano. That's right? right, that's right. But I, you know, I just think, what a, what an interesting uh, career you've had, John. Well, I appreciate that. I do. These, I these center, can I give a plug for the fact of that uh, many of my video interviews and many of my audio interviews, uh, you can access online through the University of Kansas. They have something called KU Scholar Works. And if you go up on KU Scholar Works and put my name in there, you'll find that there's right now about 140 video interviews that you can watch in real time. And if Most you put your them, name in, it says, oh no. Yeah, oh, I no. know. Get out of here. <laughs> so you can see the interview with Spielberg where, guess mm -hmm. what? I play patty cake with Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I think that's wonderful. It's at the end. <laughs> <laughs> the interview, but you can see about 140 of those there. I think that's great. So we're working on getting audio. I'll bet you up too. you'll get some more hits, John. Yeah. I bet you. And I think that it would be lots of fun to take your course. In, is it in film history or fi film criticism? What I'm is kind it? of the go-to guy for the film history courses film history. at KU. We, and I, we have a department of film and media studies, mm -hmm. and I also, in fact, I leave here to teach a course in classical film theory. Theory. I well, hope you everybody can stay awake. <laughs> That's right. Well, well, we'll pray on that. John. Yeah, indeed. I do every time. <laughs> That's right. But I, I have to say thank you so much. Oh, what a pleasure to pleasure. see you again after all these years and introduce John Tibbetts to all of you uh, and to tell you that it, he is an artist, he's a piano player, he's a, a film historian, he's a writer. He is truly a Renaissance man and he is our neighbor. So it's our community, you know, and it's been so nice to have you with us. Thank you, John. And may I say I love your conversational style. Thank you. Thank you.